proving the chain rule in calculus for power functions. All right, so I'm going to talk about this power function right here. So for instance, what I am referring to is the chain rule applies to the fact that you have composite functions. So what you see here, which I love to do, so this is uh, something of a schematic. So you have our input, so our independent variable is coming in. We have a function f at x, which is doing something to it. We are gonna be assuming that f at x is differentiable. So that means that our derivative exists within here. And you're going to get an output out there. So that particular output we know would simply be f at x, which I'm you know calling u here. So u really is just uh, f at x. And then what we're doing is, so this is where the uh, composite functions come in. You have one function and it's being fed into another one. And it turns out that our other function is a power function. Okay, so meaning that we're going to be raising it to some exponent n, and I'm going to generalize uh, this to any exponent, so any rational exponent, any you know, positive, so any fraction that you can think of. Um, and then you have your output, okay, and then I'm calling the output y. So really, okay, we have a, a composite function because we have one function, f at x, it's being fed to another, which is nothing else but a power function. And for the moment, let's assume that n is just a natural number. So it's just a counting number. So you know, it can be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, etc. Although if it's 1, okay, then, then really there's nothing else uh, to do here because the output would be f at x. Okay, so we can probably assume that n is 2 or greater. All right, so now with respect to the derivative here, so the derivative is actually nothing else but simply y, okay, so here's the, the prime for the derivative, and it is equal to um, n multiplied by our function, so this is going to be this right here, okay, so that's what we're going to get, so let me maybe duplicate this in here, so I'm going to duplicate it, and bring it down, and it is being raised now to the n minus 1. Now, this may not actually surprise you because if you remember, uh, any power function has, so if you would take a power function x to the n and you wanted to take the derivative of that, this is just simply n x minus one. Okay, so this is very reminiscent of this. The only thing is now that we do have um, a function inside of those brackets and therefore, okay, what we're gonna have to do is we're gonna have to multiply this result by the derivative of that function. And that is actually okay, what the derivative would be in total. So we want to be able to prove this result. Now, how you abbreviate uh, the derivative, of course, we can write dy dx okay, as well. So this is the same thing. I probably will just stick to the primes in terms of the notation. And let's try to see if we can knock this off. Okay, so going back to our original definition of the derivative, so we have the limit as h is approaching to zero, and now what we're doing is we're going to take our function, so that's going to be our y right here, so this is going to be f, okay, at x plus h, okay, so I'm just substituting in here, this is to the n minus, and this is going to be <clears throat> just simply f at x to the n and all over h. Okay, so that is from our standard definition of the derivative. And again, you know, we're assuming that f at x is differentiable, and you know, we know that this is differentiable because any power function is differentiable in that in that sense. So we can proceed in here. Okay, so now whenever we do this, um, and I notice that I have <clears throat> um, some exponent in here, so and if the exponent is the same, right away I start thinking back to the original proof with regards to the power function. 
Um, and there, you know, we do have a difference. So, you know, we have now, and we're going to be dealing with the nth difference um, overall. So with respect to um, this, whenever that happens, I'm going to drop for the moment. So I'll drop this limit. I'll drop this H for the moment. I'm just going to concentrate on the numerator. Um, and what I'm going to say is, so within here, just so that I don't complicate, let's call this, let's say alpha. Okay, so the alpha is equal to F um, uh, X plus H there. And then let's call this beta. Okay, just for convenience. So really, what I have there is I have alpha to the n minus okay, um, beta to the n right here. And we know this is the nth difference that this is nothing else but simply alpha minus beta um, multiplied by, okay, so this would be alpha to the n minus 1 plus alpha to the n minus 2 times beta to the 1 plus, this is going to be alpha to the n minus 3, um, beta to the 2, plus, and you know, this keeps on going. I'm going to shift this over just so that I don't run a space um, too quickly, um, although I guess I will. So this is going to be dot, 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 plus, okay, and then eventually we come back. So let's say this was, you know, alpha to the 1. This would have been beta to the n minus 2, and then finally we would finish off. Okay, actually there will be no more alpha. So this would have been just beta n minus 1. This is the nth difference. Um, and, you know, I have actually done a proof for something like this. So if you don't remember, so this is the same thing with, you know, difference of squares, difference of cubes. And then when you have the general nth difference, put up a link up above there if you have forgotten this. I have also used that in the proof of the actual power function itself. So once we have this, then what I'm going to do is notice that this alpha minus beta, okay, so because what I have done is the following. I have dropped the limit, so I just want to show you what happens here. So this is going to be the limit as h is approaching to zero. Now that alpha, so this is just f x plus h minus, all right, this is going to be f x. Okay, so that's what this is. I'm going to bring in that H. Okay, so that H is now going to be right here. And now this is going to be multiplied by this entire thing, right? So this whole thing, let me duplicate it, bring it back down here. So it's being multiplied by that, where, of course, the alpha that you see there is just F X plus H, and then the beta is just F at X. So this, okay, um, what we have looks very familiar. So if we bring in the limit, so if we, by using the limit properties, we bring it into this, okay, and then we bring it into over here, then what we're going to have is this entire thing right here. This is nothing else but simply just the derivative, okay, of our function fx, which is our first function right here that we fed x into. So that looks promising, and now it's going to be multiplying by, by all of that junk. But what is all of that junk right here? So let me, you know, shift this over. Okay, so this is now, maybe let me switch the color. So this is now the limit of h is approaching to zero. And now I have all of these different terms in here, okay, inside of the bracket. So that first term okay, is nothing else but simply f x plus h, okay, and this is all raised to the n minus 1, so that whole function, plus, now, this right here, so that alpha, okay, and then the beta, okay, so what we would have is, we would have f, x plus h, this is n minus 2, multiplied by beta, which is nothing else but fx, okay, plus and then you have dot, 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 so on. I'm not going to write all of them in here, but I think you'll recognize the pattern. Then lastly, so I'm going all the way over here, I will have now f x plus h um, multiplied by, this is, I guess, f x um, to the n minus 2 plus, and then finally, this is f 
x, all of that, to the n minus 1, right? And all of this is in brackets here, although I ran out of space. Now, as I can bring this limit into every single term over here, okay, and that includes all the way over here, then what you notice as h is approaching to 0, then my first term, so this one, is nothing else but simply f, okay, at x, okay, and this is all raised to the n minus 1, plus that second term, so this and times that, is going to be f x because h is, is approaching to 0. So this is going to be now n minus 2 times f x plus, okay, and dot, 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 and all of these wonderful terms now are simply nothing else but multiplications of our, of our function f at x. So this is what I have, and then finally, you know, so this isn't a surprise in here, this is n minus 1. And now, these are all the same, right? So fx and fx, okay, so what I now have is fx, you know, this is now n minus 1 plus, okay, fx n minus 1, because I have n minus 2 plus the 1, plus, and this continues on, so all I have is just terms of fx to the n minus 1. Now, how many of these terms do I have? And this you can go back in here. Um, there are actually n terms, and you can count them up. So, you know, you can start off, I always just look at the exponents, okay, in here, so it's n minus 1, n minus 2, and so on. It goes all the way up to 1, and then I have an extra term. So there are n terms in here. So all of this, of course, these are just like terms. I can just say this is nothing else but n times fx to the n minus 1, right? So that is by bringing this limit inside. And then let's not forget that what we had in front, we had our f derivative of this. And of course, multiplication, it doesn't matter, you know, so we can just swap this to the back and we're going to get n f x n minus 1 multiplied by the derivative of fx. And that's exactly what we were looking for. So that is actually the proof of this. And notice this is exactly what we said the derivative of the chain rule is for these power functions. So that would complete that. And I hope that that makes sense to you. Now, uh, if you are interested and, you know, if you're thinking about, well, what happens in the general case? So what happens if we had um, this right here? So maybe let me copy this down, might be a little bit faster. So I'm gonna to try to copy this entire thing. So let me do that, copy. So in the general case, because the exponent, you know, I said, well, n is an counting number and we're kind of assuming that it's, you know, two or greater. Because if it was 1, then it would have been just fx, and well, the derivative of fx is just fx itself, okay? Um, so, you know, we assume that n is basically 2 or greater, but it was positive. But what would happen if, you know, fn was negative? Or, um, even more complicated, what if we said, you know, it was n over m, and we were assuming that n over m is just some rational number, so basically a fraction, um, and you know, we can assume it's a fraction in its lowest terms. But what if it was this case? You know, is it still true that the derivative, so now in this case, the derivative would have been different. The derivative would have been n over m, because we're bringing the exponent down, and this would have been n over m minus 1, and times still your function. And that indeed is true. Now, if you wanted to prove this, you can do it in exactly the same style of thinking as this. The only thing is that you have to be careful because you do have the M at the bottom. And for anyone who's really interested and wants a hint on that, I'm going to put up a link up above there to the way that I have proved the actual power function 
Okay, so the original power function, which was this one, and you can use the same um, analogy, the same step-by-step -step approach that you will have, plus you're gonna have this extra little term coming out, okay, and that's gonna fall out for you right here as you're doing your proof. So maybe if your teachers or probably, honestly, maybe your profs, if you get into university, you might run into this. Um, if someone is making you do this in high school, uh, then probably I am your teacher, okay? Um, very few will force you to do that. But for those students who are interested in going into mathematics, uh, engineering in particular, you know, things like engineering science or some of the harder engineering courses or computer science courses that you have, they do want you to be able to kind of think in this way and don't feel bad if you don't know on your own how to do these proofs. I certainly don't come up with these things completely on my own here. You know, I've read a lot of books, you know, I've, I've read a lot of articles, I try to follow, so I am honestly, you know, showing these because I'm standing on, you know, as I think um, one of the famous scientists said, on the shoulders of giants here. Yeah, so people who come before me and have taught me a lot. So none of the proofs that I do um, are just solely coming from my own mind, okay? They're coming from many others um, who've come before me and I've just been lucky enough to learn from them and now hopefully share with you. So there you have it. So that was the proof. Um, we'll see you in a future video. Bye everybody.